Hey, how's it going, Captains? Admiral Tori here, and welcome aboard for another World of Warships video on my channel. In today's video, I am sailing the Tier 8 Royal Navy aircraft carrier, HMS Implacable. Yeah, that is quite the name that can easily describe this aircraft carrier. There's also an upcoming Tier 8 Premium Royal Navy aircraft carrier named Indomitable. I really do question that at the time they were deciding on how they were going to name these aircraft carriers, they probably thought that it was too difficult to come up with an original name and pulled out the Oxford Dictionary and find a very fitting adjective to describe one of the earliest aircraft carriers that you can get in this game that comes with an armored flight deck. She is truly an implacable aircraft carrier when enemy aircraft carriers try to die bomb you with HE. And of course using the HE rockets. So first things first, I am going to start off the game with an air raid on the German battleship Bismarck. Nothing that I got anything personal against the Germans when it comes to playing the Royal Navy aircraft carrier. I'm still waiting for that premium um, HMS Arc Royal to come out sooner or later, maybe this year, next year. I don't know, one of the more excited Royal Navy fans out there will hopefully keep me updated about when they're going to leak or tease us with the Arc Royal. And again, you can't really start off your morning with just one air raid on the Bismarck. You gotta follow up with a second air raid. So to use these Royal Navy bombers, you want to line them up at the stern or bow. And of course, there is some delay time with the drop time that you're going to hit your target. So you want to lead enough like this and get a nice, nice run on top of that Bismarck. So this game is one of the best games I had in a while. And I do do substantial amount of damage. But what made this game great is the synchronization with the friendly aircraft carrier who is in the Lexington. And fittingly enough, this guy's in-game name is Admiral Breadloaf, if I recall correctly. So you got two admirals and two aircraft carriers on this map. And it gets really interesting later on uh, when you see me start using my torpedo bombers and my um, bombers on the cruisers, battleships, and of course how the game winds down. So Royal Navy aircraft carriers. This is the first Royal Navy aircraft carrier that I showcase on this channel. And right away, this is a gorgeous aircraft carrier. I really wanted the Implacable. And also because of the name, uh, the charming name, but also have the premium camouflage, which is also a really nice camouflage that came for free, uh, well, come for free, with the Royal Navy Fly and Strike um, campaign, if I were to describe it, during that event before the aircraft here was officially released for the Royal Navy line. Of course, it went along with the CB rework. But yes, here we go again. We're gonna go strike the Bismarck because the Royal Navy just can't get enough of the Bismarck. I'm trying really, I'm trying really hard not to reenact <laughs> The, the showdown between the Royal Navy and the Bismarck starting off with trying to jam the rudder on the Bismarck. But here we go. We gotta send some torpedoes to the broadside. It looks pretty good, but I didn't leak quite enough. So one of the problems with the Royal Navy torpedo bombers is that their torpedoes are very slow. I think slower than the Americans, but from what I heard, or at least from my experience so far, I haven't really checked on the stats on it, but these have a shorter range, as in you don't have to drop it at a distance compared to like the Japanese before they arm. So that is the benefit of using the Royal Navy uh, torpedo bomber is there. They're very easy, you know, it's really friendly to use, but if you're going up against a player that knows what they're doing, um, it becomes a problem because you don't have the number of torpedoes like the Americans, which in this case, the Lexington can drop three torpedoes, nor do you have the torpedo speed like the Japanese. You have precision. So in the case of dealing with something like the Jervis or a destroyer, it's not really ideal to use torpedo bombers with the Royal Navy aircraft carriers on fast, small, moving targets or maneuverable targets in general. Uh, I had a game with my War Spy some time ago that I did very well, unfortunately I didn't record, where I actually just dodged so many torpedoes from the Furious. So right here, 
you're witnessing the the flaws with the Royal Navy uh, torpedo bombers. But nonetheless, I'm not going to send these planes back until I try to do something against that Jervis. And I do get lucky with one torpedo hit on that Jervis. I promise you is that is just pure luck. It's not a reliable choice of weapon to use against a destroyer. What I personally prefer to use is these bombers. So what makes the Royal Navy special in this game, their characteristic is that they have special bombers. Instead of using a dive bomber, they love a bomb or carpet bomb. Um, I know there is a technical term. I was having a difficult time looking for it, but I just call them bombers. They, they really do just some simple air raids style of bombing and this is why I love uh, using the Royal Navy aircraft gears. It's, it's really cool. It's one of the best um, effects that you can get in this game. It's just showing off this line of bombing. It reminds me of the Call of Duty Black Ops, I think B-52 bomb run or the Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 when you get the stealth bomber and it flies through the map and drops <laughs> its payload. But really fun, is it effective compared to the American HE uh, dive bombers? I prefer the dive bombers. To put in perspective, the Royal Navy level bombing or the carpet bombing, it's more like an area effect. You, you, you bank on the fact that one of your bombs will get lucky and hit your target. So you have a higher chance of, you know, something like a battleship is much more effective because you can set more fires since it's much more spread out due to that area effect. Now, in the case of the American dive bombers, you concentrate all your bombs in one location. Same goes for the Japanese, if you're talking about the Kaga, but the Kaga doesn't have powerful HE bombs because the Japanese are more focused, at least on the main line, with the AP bombs, which is a whole different story. But with the Americans, if you're going up against a cruiser or a destroyer and you do hit the destroyer or cruiser, it does a lot more damage compared to the Royal Navy um, bombers. But for me, it's... You know, after all these years of playing aircraft carriers, yeah, right there, <laughs> yeah, right there, you thought Katsuki that she can get away with it. The only time I ever use the fighters with the rockets is to finish off targets. Uh, I don't have them upgraded, but well, after uh, this gameplay, I do have it upgraded. But at the moment, uh, when I was recording this gameplay, I don't have the upgraded fighters. But yeah, they they're really fun to use with the uh, bombers. For me, it's just a new experience after all these years just using dive bombers on the American and Japanese aircraft carrier line. So, took out the Akatsuki because she was a number one target since she is coming from behind the uh, the carrier location, if I put it that way. A lot of destroyers love to sneak in on the carriers because carriers are just like salmon and tuna for a Japanese restaurant. They are top high quality meat that you want to uh, get, especially as a destroyer but it does come at a high price if you don't succeed in taking out a carrier as a destroyer. So right here, I decided to strike the New Orleans. Originally, I wanted to hit the Charles Martel, but the Charles Martel sent her, uh, her fighter plane out at that moment. And the other reason why I was discouraged to not strike the Charles Martel, and here, here's a really nice combo. First, the New Orleans fly over the mountain, the, the island, and go for the Amaki. But the other reason I didn't go for the Charles Martel because the French have very fast cruisers, especially with engine boost. Like I said in the beginning, Royal Navy torpedoes are too slow to catch these type of fast maneuverable ship. But it is still doable, and you'll witness it later on in the game where I pull off uh, a strategy known as the anvil and hammer attack. Uh, that was a very common tactic way back before the CV rework and you might ask is it possible to this day and it is very possible with the Royal Navy aircraft carrier. And one of the reasons why it's possible is because these planes are currently the most maneuverable planes that you can use in this game at the cost of speed because these guys are maneuverable and they're heavily armored. So if you prefer speed, you might want to play the Japanese or the Americans. So right here, Admiral Breadloaf uh, drop a torpedo, and right here I'm trying to synchronize with his attack. I'm going to follow up by taking advantage of the Charles Martel maneuvering uh, against those torpedoes, and drop on the Charles Martel. Scored three hits, did a decent amount of damage, not enough that I would like compared to like the American dive bombers. If I was if I was in a dive bomber from the American Lexington, I would have probably done like at least 5k. 
Charles Martel, she is angling into the drop zone and also in the direction of the torpedoes. Took one torpedo to the broadside. The anti-air is intensifying and I decided to pull out because there was just not enough space for me to work with in order to go for another strike on the Charles Martel, especially at that low of a health pool for my planes. It's just not worth trying because you want, um, it, you know, it takes roughly more than a minute and a half or m maybe two minutes. I don't recall the exact number, but it takes a while to regenerate this, these planes. You're better off just sending them back, uh, repair them, and then send out a fresh full group out there. So, Randall Charles Martel, uh, she's fleeing from the battle because she is fairly low after being attacked by the two carriers. So I decided to switch my attention to the Lyon, but not completely neglect the Charles Martel because I want to sink a ship. One less ship to deal with is always nice instead of just farming damage off a, a target like the Lyon. And right here, I actually tricked the Charles Martel in thinking that I was focused on the Lyon because at this moment, Charles Martel thought that, oh, the Implacable is focusing on Lyon, so I'm gonna turn broadside and join back on the battle but that won't be the case. And right here, you gotta witness the flaw of these little torpedoes, fast cruisers. But then again, I did say that I was gonna set up a strategy, a trap. And the Charles Martel played into my trap, played into my card, and it's going to have to sail broadside to the second set of torpedoes. Taking advantage of the maneuverability of these torpedo planes, and also setting up the Charles Martel to sail in a straight line because she has to decide between taking the torpedoes from the stern or the broadside, pretty much cost her her ship. Now, if I were in the, in the situation of the Charles Martel, the best situation, the best case of surviving that kind of attack, assuming that you're going up against me, would be to stop right away, let the torpedoes pass the ship, and accelerate, because the Charles Martel is more than capable of accelerating. So after you stop, you dealt with the torpedoes behind, and the second wave of the, the planes coming by for the broadside, um, like I said, the torpedoes are slow, with the engine boost, and maybe possibly without the engine boost, you might get away with it if you're lucky enough if the player uh, miscalculate the um, drop. The, uh, you know, the, the, the estimation of the distance, how far you had to lead. So, Charles Martel's out of the game. Uh, we're losing, we're down by roughly 100 point. Uh, earlier, the Mahan Leon was very close to the cap. Now I'm going to switch my focus to the Leon. Uh, Admiral Breadloaf is also switching his um, priority to Leon because Leon is the closest target. We're gonna double team on this target. He drops a set of torpedoes onto the broadside of the Leon. I'm going to go to the left here and well if the Leon survived that attack the reason I went left is because Leon is turning right which gives me the uh, wide open position to actually try to go for another great run from the stern of the Leon. So right here um, the Lexington and I, we are all up here because earlier the Akatsuki pushed us up here and we were pretty close to the enemy uh, fleet. We decided that, hey, it seems like we clear the um, the threat, but now we are down to the situation where it's just me and Admiral Bradlow. What are we going to do? So the next target ideally would be the Amagi because that is the biggest target. And I believe, even though all these years I've been playing World of Warships, I never pay attention to the standard battle uh, counter, but I think battleships, if you sink a battleships, you take out a lot of points from uh, the enemy team. So I am going to take the opportunity to strike this Amagi. She is presenting a nice broadside. I'm going to dive in with these torpedo bombers and she's going to react with sending her fighters out. Now she is turning slightly to the port, but it is not enough to dodge those two torpedoes. Admiral Breadloaf is going to follow up with a torpedo run on the bow of the Amagi. At the same time, opening the door for me for another run, because you might have noticed, Admiral Breadloaf's torpedo bombers aggro the Amagi's fighters and I'm able to actually just strike the Amagi with no problems or hindrance from the fighter. Now that was a difficult angle of attack, but with the nice precision of these torpedo bombers, the advantage of playing a Royal Navy aircraft carrier, I was actually able to land both of my torpedoes on that small profile uh, Amagi at that moment. And again, the Amagi 
is not as maneuverable as she wants to be and takes another set of torpedoes. But I'm unable to finish up with the final torpedo flight because the enemy implacable came to assist the Amagi by dropping a fighter on the Amagi's position. Now you're probably asking me, why am I sailing towards the Amagi? Or at least more specifically, why aren't I selling broadside with the Lexington? Well, the implacable. As much as I want to say that she's implacable when it comes to the flight deck, shattering those destroyer shells, shattering light cruiser shells, not able to uh, penetrate the armored deck of the implacable with HE bombs, she does have a large citadel profile. Which means that you got a ship like the Amagi, which is equipped with 10 406mm guns that can easily end my ship. Now I'm going to go for one last torpedo run on the Amagi and end this guy's career. Send him back because at the right moment before uh, I sent that torpedo bomber, I noticed that the Jervis suddenly appeared on the map. Now if the Jervis actually smoked up earlier and let uh, let my ship sail towards her because I wouldn't notice since there wouldn't be any uh, indication or warning on the left side as you might have noticed aircraft here has been detected I probably would have sailed into that Jervis and the Jervis would have sent 10 torpedoes at my ship ending my entire aircraft carrier career and never playing the implacable ever again but due to her mistake the uh, Jervis did appear and starting firing at my deck which is pretty useless because like I said Armor flight deck, a very nice feature aboard the Implacable. Now somebody is actually capturing our base, and it can't be the Implacable. The last known position from the Shokaku was at their base, if you notice on the mini map, and you probably guessed it. The Japanese Shokaku sailed across the world to capture our base, which is crazy. I, I did not expect the Shokaku to appear right here. Which is unfortunate because now she is stopping our points and now the enemy team is going to have a bigger uh, bigger point lead than our situation. But at the same time, she opened herself to being attacked by Admiral Breadloaf and Admiral Hattori. So I'm going to send those fighters back and send out the the nice bombers this is this is what these bombers are made for this is the perfect target you guys about to witness what makes the implacable or at least the royal navy bombers fun to use when you got a ship that has a flat deck a wide profile just so happens that the size of this ship fits the ellipse of this bomber yeah, it's not going to end so well with the Shokaku. The Shokaku is going to have a very bad day. Admiral Breadloaf dropped a torpedo set onto the broadside of the Shokaku. Shokaku is sailing forward and I got myself into a position where it is perfect to drop and end the Shokaku's career. Look at that. This is the most satisfying uh, attack run I had with the Implacable. As a result, the Shokaku is no longer a moving runway, she is now a artificial reef. Now this leaves us with the Jervis and the Implacable. We are shy by 5 points, which means that there's only one target left to, to get, and that is the Jervis. That is the only way we're going to win. Now if the Shokaku didn't sit in our cap, there's a good chance that we would have been ahead in points, but at the same time we probably would not of sunk the Shokaku, unless the Shokaku was nearby, then we would probably would be in the winning position. So we are left with only one choice under a minute, and that is to try to search for the Jervis. I'm going to fly towards the last known position of the Jervis and triangulate from that point on to figure out where the Jervis is exactly uh, at since that last known position. Admiral Breadloaf with her Lexington did spot the Jervis there, and I'm going to use my engine boost and rush uh, to the Jervis. The enemy Jervis smokes up, which is a smart move, and we got no other choice but to try and drop on uh, these bombs. Using the area effect, this wide area effect, I'm trying to hit the Jervis, might get lucky. And right here, if I held off on that attack, or if I didn't rush it, if I just slowed down, I probably would have spot that Jervis and get a better uh, strike on that Jervis, but unfortunately, 
uh, we weren't able to sync the Jervis. Now, if I did sync the Jervis, we still would have lost that game because you might have noticed the Lexington was low. And the reason why the Lexington was low was because earlier she was broadside to the Amagi. But it was a great game. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Both the the enemy carrier and the Lexington earned a compliment from me because it, it's been a while since I enjoyed a CV game. Aside from that, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I'll see you guys next time on World of Warships. <laughs>